and welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And returning as my second guest for the second time, Vivian Taylor. How are you doing today? I am doing extremely well. It's great to be back. Yeah, it's great to have you back on. And um, the topic of today is kind of um, interesting. It's a little, a little more advanced in, in, the, in, the, in the field of Christian studies or Christian history, but it's very fun. It's very interesting. People are going to enjoy this. And um, yeah, you were about to say something? Oh, I was going to say, well, in some ways it's advanced, but I also think that uh, especially for many Eastern Orthodox Christians, this is uh, foundational in a way that as often Western Christians or atheist or non-religious folks who are more used to like the Western sort of Catholic and Protestant version of Christianity, has a chasm is extremely important in understanding what is in a lot of ways the older version of uh, Orthodox Christianity that we see in places like Greece and Russia, and, and of course many others. But yeah, so I'm excited to go into all of this. Why don't we just start off with what exactly is hesychasm for someone who has no idea? Because I, I, I didn't know much about it. I've heard it, but I, until, you, until you recommended this topic, I didn't really not, pretty, pretty much knew nothing about it. And I you know, did some reading Wikipedia pages and stuff like that. So very limited am I. But tell us about it. So hesychasm uh, is at a very basic level. Uh, the internal practice of Christian prayer that uh, seeks the, uh, and I am very bad at pronouncing Greek, forgive me now, anyone who is watching this, my deepest apologies, but this is about seeking hezekia. It's about seeking a spiritual peace that's a peace with yourself, a peace with the world, and a peace with God. And in that piece, not just finding a complete negation, not just a complete silence, but um, I, I think one way you can sort of describe it, this isn't necessarily a historical description. Uh, and, and I'll just also say from the beginning, I uh, have practiced hesychastic med meditations every day wow. since I was a teenager. And I am now in my What do you think about it? What is your what are your thoughts on it? I, I believe it is one of the most valuable spiritual practices. It is one of those things where and, and, and I guess just to be like very clear, because I, I know that sometimes when you're talking about spiritual practice, it, it, it can all sound a little like Hogwarts school right. of witchcraft and wizardry. And it's a bit what the practice I do, I learned from two very important people in my life in my late teens. One of them was a gay Episcopalian when I was in the process of uh, converting from Southern Baptist to Episcopal. And I was like, oh, my God, a, a church where there are gay people. And one of the people told me the Jesus prayer, which is in more or less its most simple form. Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy. Uh, and this can be expanded, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You can keep going out in that direction. You can make it very complex, but you don't have to. Sure. But that basic prayer of saying, Jesus Christ, Son of God, God yourself, have mercy, is a very common prayer that you see in the New Testament Gospels when people are seeking help from Jesus. So uh, from sort of, you know, uh, 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 Farrell, and, and because we're both talking about Eastern Orthodoxy, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, now the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, uh, uh, there's both big O and little O Orthodoxy. There's like the Orthodox tradition as opposed to the Roman Catholic tradition. But, and yeah, this comes from around... Uh, 1,000. It's a little after 1,000, but as the Pope is growing in power after the fall of the Roman Empire, but as uh, the church in Constantinople, which is the center of Orthodox Christianity, 
uh, is still under a Roman emperor because the Eastern Roman Empire, of course, didn't fall until the 1450s. So uh, the Eastern Empire, uh, which never called itself the Byzantine Empire, only ever thought of itself as like you know, Rome. Rome. Yeah. Uh, they have a very rich religious tradition, which is still alive with us in you know uh, various Orthodox churches. But I, I think for those fourteen hundred years that it was there, I, I, I mean, give or take, you know. Although there was a city there before uh, Constantine built Constantinople, so Byzantium, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, there's stuff that was there, but um, the the Byzantine Christian tradition is absolutely fascinating. And hesychasm is an extremely important part of it. Uh, basically, you, you go from very early, like some of the desert fathers, you have other, early, yeah, yeah. You, and you have um, uh, a lot of folks as early as the second century, early monastic figures, especially like St. Anthony, you know, the guy in the desert who's wrestling with demons, he's a hesychast. And so hesychasm becomes an important part starting in sort of these desert, you know, when you're leaving. And then you start getting these really huge theological figures like pseudo Dionysus in late fourth, early fifth century, um, who is a Neoplatonist. And, that's Anthony, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a there's a great one if you ever find it of him struggling with demons in his monastic cell. Ooh, let me see if I can find that one. There's a lot of photo, uh, images of him. Oh no, uh, he is. A, I mean, he's one of the founders of the monastic tradition. Yeah. Saint Anthony is an incredibly important uh, figure in the monastic tradition. Yeah. And um, oh, I found it. I found it. Ha <laughs> Nice. Good, good. Talking, I have to screenshot it because it's not it's not a JPEG, but you could just keep talking about it. I'll, I'll pull it up. Yeah, and, and so you get uh, folks like Pseudo Dionysius, who uh, is a Neoplatonist. He does a great job of talking about how there's only one God, and while it can seem like there is a second power, there's really just God and nothingness. And uh, he wrote the celestial hierarchy that explains how you know, the various angels work. And, you know, they're the angels that are nearest to God, who are very much like the four luminaries that we see in Gnostic texts, like uh, the secret book of John. Uh, and there are lesser angels. And at every level, you know, there are also some that have gone bad, so you can't ever trust anything. But... You have Pseudo Dionysius who sets this up. And then later, late fifth, early sixth, you have figures like John Climacus, which uh, is a great name, John Climacus, because he is going to the climax. Uh, he wrote a monastic guide called The Ladder of Divine Ascent, uh, which this episode gets its name from. And The Ladder of Divine Ascent is uh, a wild book, which even in Eastern Orthodoxy today is one of those texts where it's like, hey, this is like important and good, but absolutely handle this one with care because it has the potential to be dangerous. Uh, and I'll get back to why it has the potential to be dangerous. So then you go forward. This There's a big monastic tradition you get the foundation of Mount Athos around like the 800s, which is the major monastery in the Byzantine world, which true story. My father uh, spoke Greek and had, even though we were Baptists, had strong connections with the Greek Orthodox community on the East Coast in America. Uh, so when I was growing up, I had an opportunity to go and like study it and like, go to Mount Athos and spend a couple of weeks. Wow. But is this it? Yeah. yeah. Wow, I mean, beautiful. Oh yeah. No, it's the most incredible thing. It's a giant holy mountain, uh, but it's 
it's meant in only in a very serious way. And I knew I was trans then. And so I didn't like feel, you know, it wouldn't have, I could have gone, but it didn't feel like it would have been honest. Uh, but Mount Athos, very important place. And Hezekasm really uh, finds a home in the monastic tradition that is really typified at Mount Athos, but also especially under the Eastern Roman Empire, there are monasteries all over the place. So the monastic life is a very important part of Byzantine political and religious life. And so hesychasm is everywhere. And you also have to understand that this is going to become important. There's a wide range of levels of wealth and education, even among monks. So not everybody has the same, uh, you know, just because somebody's a monk doesn't necessarily mean they're like educated in all ways. Interesting. Yeah. So by like the 1300s, you, uh, you, you have an Italian guy named Barlam who comes over, converts to Greek Orthodoxy. He becomes the abbot of a monastery and, you know, and he's getting to know people and he begins writing against hesychasm. So now we've sort of gone through this. What is hesychasm? <laughs> so basically you are meditating and you can take something like the Jesus prayer, which has its roots in early Christianity and which has been practiced. And, uh, and you can sit and say it. And if you mean it, because one thing about the Jesus prayer is it's supposed to be a prayer of the heart. It's not just like you're repeating rote syllables. Right. You have, you are literally asking the living resurrected Jesus for mercy over and over again in such a way that it is quieting your heart. Now you see a little bit of this. So what happens when you meditate? What happens when you pray? Um, and, and this is where the controversy between Barlam and who, the guy who becomes the great defender of hesychasm and, uh, you know, in some ways, thereby the defender of orthodoxy is Gregory Palamas, who, cool. yeah, whose uh, icon has been on the header for this video. Right. So what their fight is over is with this prayer practice of saying, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy over and over again. And, you know, we can, uh, you know, like I, I have taught this uh, prayer practice as well. I was for a little while a pastor out in Los Angeles. I was working at Hollywood United Methodist, which, wow. is, like, which is like a block north of like Man's Chinese Theater. It's right there by the Hollywood Bowl. And I would walk through Hollywood on my way to work and you'd see like meditation classes, $80 an hour, you know, $80 for a 20 minute meditation class. Oh, come get your cosmic ray meditation. Get your ancient hollow earth homeopathic meditation. And what I said was, look, y'all, I'll, I'll, I will teach you an ancient meditation with a dense, deep uh, tradition, which has had both good and bad uh, things to come out of it. I'll, I'll do it for free. And literally, the best way to do it, to learn it, is to just set a timer. It can be an egg timer. Everybody's got a timer on their phone. Pick some very, like, don't blow it out. Pick an achievement that you're going to hit. Do like three minutes and just sit still and shut your eyes and pray over and over. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. That, that simple and that complex. And the idea is that while saying this and while holding on to that real connection with Jesus, with God in, you know, because Jesus is God in Orthodox thinking. You are at once quieting yourself down 
and staying connected to God. So uh, you are a sort of modern way of thinking, like with the James Webb telescope uh, that we, you know, I don't know if you've seen any of the recent pictures. Oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And sort of what you're doing is you're taking this very powerful like camera and you are looking past the solar system. You're looking past the galaxy. You're looking past the Laniakea supercluster. And you're looking out into the deep darkness. And in the deep darkness, you're able to see all of these, you know, black holes and gravitational lensing and the uh, background rate. Uh, what is it? You know, I'm sorry. I'm not. Uh, I'll admit it now. I'm not a physicist or an astro. Oh, right. <laughs> it's OK. But in the same way that, like, you have to put the telescope way outside of Earth because Earth is a very noisy place. You have to like, I mean, you know, you're not like putting the prayer outside of yourself, but you're like quieting down so you can look past your own personal thoughts, your own personal feelings. You can like, uh, there, there, there's a saying in Pseudo Dionysius that prayer is the prayer is the monk's mirror. I'll say that again. Prayer is the monk's mirror in that as you pray as you meditate you are sort of forced to be both fully aware of yourself and also aware that the image of yourself that you're aware of is not the full and complete you and in that place the idea goes that you are able to continue discerning the greater realities uh, and that you are able to move up in some ways. And like you have to move up your perception to be able to not just see the signs of God, the created you know, the, the, the created messages from God to us, but to be able to see even beyond that to the actual uncreated God, like the divinity, the divinity self that is infinitely beyond us. And that, I am aware, sounds like a pretty big deal. And, and, and I think... It makes a lot of sense to talk about it in some terms from Gnosticism that the viewers here of Gnostic Informant uh, might be a little more familiar with because, uh, you know, let me be clear. Barlam in the 1300s directly accused Gregory Palamas and the Hesychasts of being Gnostics. Right, right, right. Yeah, he said that they were Bogomils. Which, <laughs> You know, like, and because he was an Aristotelian and he was taking, he was not um, one of the, uh, he was not a Dominican friar or anything, but he was influenced by old Thomas Aquinas and this sort of Thomas Aristotelianism. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm fascinated by the theory that there were no Cathars and the Cathars were sort of an invention of the Roman Catholic Church. I'm also a little suspicious because it seems to me that there were probably like, like there was something going on. Like they, like they didn't invent the Waldensians. The Waldensians are still around and their descriptions of the Waldensians are fairly accurate to what the Waldensians themselves say. So do you think there's a common thread among these groups? That is this meditation thing. You think this this is what it is? I th well, I think that there were a lot of spiritual practices, and I think that often when people who were holding on to a more Western church perspective didn't understand other people's spiritual practices, they would often just call them Gnostics. Right. Yeah. They turned into like a, it's like the term magus, magi, or something. It's like it's like you just throw it at people. To describe those people over there, they're not like like something different, something the other, you know. Sort of, or it's like 
I think it's sort of similar to how like a lot of different people got accused of being witches. Right. Yeah. Like the yeah. Well, the the Benedetti and the Maladetti, or there's like some weird Italian tradition where like you're going out at night in your dreams to fight witches and you're doing magic in your dreams to fight the witches. So you're sort of a good witch and it really isn't a witch thing, but the church was like, Oh, that's witchcraft. We got to burn all these people. When in fact, it's like probably something else entirely. And it's like, what do you think Peter and Paul and what do you think they were doing in the book of acts? I mean, what would you call, how is that not witchcraft in your, in your witchcraft terminology? You know what I mean? Like, is it, it's not, is it not the same thing? Absolutely. And so Gnosticism, I think, you know, I, I do think it's very useful if nothing else to look at, because if we're thinking, because we don't have really surviving Cathars to give their side of the story, but we know that this sort of Aristotelian Thomist perspective was used to wipe them out uh, in the 1200s and the 1300s. And so if nothing else, it's a useful second example to see another Latin Christian guy uh, who is influenced by Thomas Aquinas also calling his opponents Gnostics right. in an attempt uh, to and get Poly it. Polycarp, too. Polycarp used that word, too. It's called. He said, um, Marcion wanted me to... Uh, what do you say? Some, some, something along the lines of Marcion wanted me to acknowledge him. And uh, I just said that he's the, he's the firstborn of Satan. Like they just like, they just can't stand these people who have. And, the, and by the way, I've heard a quote from somebody. I can't remember who it was. They said almost every sect and denomination, even the heretics have a leg to stand on in scripture somewhere. There's something in the Bible that they can point to and say, that's why we think the way we think, because Jesus said this, or Jesus did that, or they did this. There's something there. Like, it's, it's, there's so much stuff in there that you can pull from it and make a theology, and it's, and it's based on the Bible. It's Bible-believing theology. But, well, you know what St. Irenaeus said about that? What was he that? said that this is why you need the tradition of the apostles through the bishops. Right. Otherwise, it's like you have a beautiful image uh, that is then smashed up and you take the pieces from the broken image and make a mosaic that communicates an entirely different image. But you know what's ironic about that? And I, I, I get what you're saying, but like on the flip side of that, Christianity itself is sort of a product of people taking things from the Old Testament, taking things from the culture and starting a new movement out of that through Jesus. So it's like you, you, can't, you, you can't have it both ways. Like you're a product of that. Absolutely. Right? I mean, and, and I think like that specific question of what are we actually capable of knowing is at the core of the debate around hesychasm and the controversy about hesychasm. Because to be clear, one of the claims made by Gregory Palamas and later hesychasts is that through the practice of hesychasm, you can achieve a direct, literal experience of God that is not negotiated. It's tangible, something that you can experience, something real. So the, the example that is used over and over and that is talked about is the light at the transfiguration on Mount Tabor. Do you know about the transfiguration at all? Yeah, yeah. It's something that turns up in all the Gospels, and it also turns up in Second Peter with, like, you know, the, the you know, and you can say, oh, you can well, say Second Peter, you know, who wrote it, but you're, it, it is preserving a tradition of Peter's perspective on the Transfiguration as well. Interesting. So it, it's it's. it's it's, a, it's achieving that light. And even there's even quotes from Jesus talking about the, the eye of the body. Your whole body is filled with light. And there's a lot of people who point to that and they'll say, what is that? Some sort of like Buddhist thing, some third eye thing? Because it really is a strange passage. It doesn't really make sense compared to everything else in the Old Testament or the New Testament. It's sort of a new, new concept. The eye of the body becomes single. Your whole body is filled with light. Like, so what, 
I'm curious to know what you think about that first. I, I mean, I, I think it, like from a hesychastic perspective, what is happening is through prayer, through relationship with Jesus, we are, because like there's a big question about what actually happens in the transfiguration. Like, a, very, like fairly soon before the, crucifixion the passion the you know the end of jesus's life he has his three closest disciples um you know who are the same ones that are later mentioned in paul when he goes to the the pillars of the church they go up with him on to mount tabor and they there they see the blinding radiance of god and Jesus is talking with Moses and Elijah. And notably, the disciples do not understand what is going on exactly. Like Peter is like, Lord, Lord, well, this is wonderful. Why don't I build three you know, houses up here? And then we'll all just say, and Jesus is like, buddy, you're... Poor Peter in the Gospels, <laughs> by the way. He is, well, he's always the butt monkey. He's my favorite character. He really is. He's my favorite character. I mean, I think... He's the most human. He's the most understandable. Yeah, and, you know, and he... And, and he also does the thing you want every character in a story to do. He fucks up, like, really badly. Yeah. He is not a perfect person. Like, he, like, denies Christ and... After watching all those miracles, he's like, no, I don't, I don't know that dude. Galilee? Where's Galilee? I don't know him. Who's that guy? <laughs> I mean, it's... But... He, the light is communicated to him. And this this gets into the other part of what's going on here is that literally by being in communication with Christ, by by receiving the divine light, which according to Hesychasts, the light that is seen on Mount Tabor is not like it's not like light in the real world where it's like photons coming off of a source and the photons are separate from the light bulb. Like, I, you have to remember that this is from stuff written between, a th you know, uh, like 650 to, you know, uh, 2,000 years ago. So right. forgive me if the physics don't line up perfectly. Right. Right. But the idea that's pushed in Gregory Palamas, and I've got a quote that I just want to read, and he's quoting... He himself is quoting Pseudo-Dionysius. So, you know, at some point... Quoting someone who's quoting someone who's quoting someone is a little bit like looking down a deep well and saying, hey, what's going on down there? But here we are. Uh, ba -ba -da. Okay. Similarly, beyond the stripping away of beings, or rather after the secession of our perceiving or thinking of them is accomplished not only in words, but in reality, there remains an unknowing which is beyond knowledge, uh, though indeed a darkness. It is yet beyond radiance, and as the great uh, Dinis says, and Dinis is a name that's also used for pseudo-Dionysus, it is a dazzling darkness that the divine things are given. To... It is in this dazzling darkness that the divine things are given to the saints. Thus, the perfect contemplation of God and divine things is not simply an abstraction, but beyond this abstraction, there is a participation in divine things, a gift and a possession rather than just a process of negation. Hmm. So I think... Often in life, and I also just want to admit that probably all meditative practices in the America of 2020 are so deeply influenced by Buddhist meditation that, like, it's very difficult because it's been so, so soaked into our culture that it's a little bit difficult because I haven't, like, really studied Buddhist meditation to fully pick out the parts that are seeping in. Right. So 
To anyone watching who knows more than me about the Buddhist side of meditation, the way it's interacted with the way Christians talk about meditation, please forgive me if I'm missing anything big. You know, I'm happy to learn, happy to read anything. But it seems like, especially in like American mindfulness meditation, frankly, to me at least, it often seems like the idea is that you are only quieting yourself down. You're only like, you know, you're working for some boss and your boss wants you to work harder, but you're upset about it. But if you do this mindfulness meditation, you can kind of chill out and, you know, compartmentalize your feelings and be a better uh, capitalist cog in the machine. <laughs> you know, chug, 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 chug. But I think has a chasm that there is a difference. And I think that that difference is that while you are seeking the sort of void beyond reality, the void in which reality rests, you are also seeking that void kind of in faith as much as possible that there is, there, there is a super cosmic divinity. There is something that is ultimately beyond all of this, but at the same time that that is ultimately beyond us is also purely communicating itself back to us, both through the historical individual of Jesus Christ and through this, this divine light, this what they call the Taboric light, which is maybe the Holy Spirit maybe the super essential energy of God, but is wow. literally uh, the uncreated God shining forth. Interesting. And, and, you know, this is put in, you know, and, and, and some of these ideas go back farther. Like, you know, uh, when Moses was up getting, talking face to face with God and comes down with his shining face and no one's able or, to look at it. The voice of God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so early Christians, and I think even Second Peter, so it's sort of in the New Testament, are directly connecting that experience and the shining face to the transfiguration. Right. And thus, like, because humanity is able to participate in the true ultimate divinity, we are able to be communicated divinate like God is able to be communicated to us in such a way that we are divinized, that we experienced theosis and like, and this is not said that theosis in orthodoxy is different than like theosis in, for instance, Mormonism where like, it's not like Mormonism where it's as God. And, and once again, I bought, Although I did when I was in seminary, I actually, we, we had a, a Mormon woman in my class on theosis that I took. Really? Yeah. So we had a lot of very fascinating discussions about the difference between uh, the Greek Orthodox conception of theosis and the Mormon you conception. Think, you think someone who doesn't believe in a uh, personal deity can, can participate in some sort of form of this or even, or would that just be regular meditation? I mean, I think that it's very, I mean, one of the things about hesychasm is that it assumes that your that human conceptions of God are imperfect. Like Barlam, back once again in the 1300s, Barlam has said, one of his big points is, like, like the, he was also involved in a fight do you know much about the fight in the Nicene Creed over whether the Holy Spirit proceeds yeah. only from the Father or from the Father and the Son, the Filioque? Yeah, wasn't it the Arians that were fighting against that? Or was not the Arians? What we was are it? fighting about it yeah. today. Okay. Catholics have the uh, the Catholics have the Holy Spirit, Roman Catholics, because Catholic just means universal. Right. right people yeah, no. I, my, my sister-in-law is Roman Catholic. I love the Catholics. 
Catholics. <laughs> yeah, I grew. I technically grew up Roman Catholic, very loosely, not not religiously, but like through tradition. Have an Italian grandmother who's actually from her her her, her parents or grandparents are from Rome, and uh, yeah, so we all got con- confirmed and all that baptized. But it was one. It was like the it was like the family tradition is you, you go through the motions and then you just don't talk about it. You know that uh, I I think that's how a lot of Catholics are like. Though. Yeah, I mean I've known so many Catholic folks and I've like you know dated Catholic folks who had that experience, and I've also known some people who are super super into it, and I've also known some people who are super super into it who are also gay on the down low and have very weird lives but you know i uh and i got to know a lot of them through being a gay episcopalian in boston and i was like well (laughs) the the church is not hurting for gay priests if nothing we have a couple of super chats if you want to do you want to get to them totally all right because they're pretty good questions and i'm sure that it'll steer the conversation uh mummy veil thank you for the super chat why don't Christians today practice the Buddhist-like asceticism that Gregory Palamas practiced in the mountains of Athos? Or do they? They 100% do. Wow. How come we, never, how come we don't see them as much? We, we see like the, the Kenneth Copeland types. We see the, the televangelists. We see those people. But how come we don't see these, these aesthetics in the mountains? Because they don't have cameras on them probably, right? I mean, I I think that that's true, but, uh, you know, there's a wonderful Orthodox uh, monastery called like Holy Cross Monastery in West Virginia that has a great YouTube channel that live streams all their services. Um, And, you know, like once again, they're very politically conservative, so I'm not like endorsing their politics. Right. But their music is absolutely beautiful, and uh, a dear friend of mine gave me a rosary. But even in the Episcopal Church, uh, we you know we have monasteries. Uh, I have one of my best friends is a guy named Brother Sean, who became a monk at the Society of St. John the Evangelist in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, It's, I think, the oldest monastery on the East Coast. There are a couple of older Spanish monasteries in California, uh, but it's very old. It's sort of right around the corner from, like, Harvard Square, if you have any idea where that is. And they have an absolutely beautiful liturgical life. They're very active in the community. Uh, When I lived in Boston, the bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts was at the time actually a brother uh, from the Society of St. John the Evangelist. And they also do a lot of very important spiritual work of, in an ongoing way, helping people grow, helping keep spiritual tradition and spiritual practice alive in the church. Um, And and I I also think, and even like Gregory Palamas talks about this, that it's important that everyone finds their own level. Like John Climacus, who I talk about, he is a monk in the late 5th, early 6th century, he, the reason his book is a handle with care book is that he is very much into hesychasm, but the harshness of the monastic community that he is in, like you could, I believe, like make a horror movie out of the ladder of divine ascent. Wow. Let me just be clear with it. He says that you need, if you are a young monk, you need to accept physical abuse from your superiors so as to learn humility. Wow. That's kind of intense. Yeah. Um, um, Pegasus, thank you for super chat. I'm waiting for the James Webb telescope to catch Allah in the act of pelting jinn with stars because they were listening to the exalted assembly. Jinn are evidently nosy little suckers. <laughs> well, just- Look, do yourself a favor. It's, uh, you can find translations of it free online at like tertullian.org. Look up Pseudo Dionysius's celestial hierarchy. It's really complicated, but one of the points it makes is that the, the celestial, 
as pseudo Dionysus calls them, the celestial intelligences. It is all about their desire to be in, to look on and be in communion with God. And you know, this and, and once again, this unknowable ultimate transcendent God, which is in many ways uh, beyond our ability to fully understand, but we can have some access to. But uh, this thing about even like the excluded spirits still wanting to have communion with God is something that like you, you even see in early Christianity and, it, and, and has a chasm. And, and I'll admit, I don't fully understand uh, all the stuff around jinn in Islam. So if I, I will admit I don't fully understand that. So if I say anything wrong, please forgive me. But if you if you are interested in Christian perspectives on demons and demonology, get into the hesychastic tradition. Wow, interesting. Yeah. I gotta check that out. Like the uh, the the picture you showed a little earlier with Saint Anthony battling demons. Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. So. This is how Hesychasts experience a lot of life. There's this idea that if you're practicing Hesychasm, if you are like successfully quieting yourself, you are just going to be mobbed with demons that are trying to lead you astray. And these demons are going to try to lead you astray, both through sort of normal means of, ah, isn't this prayer too much? Isn't this boring? Isn't this, uh, don't you want to go do something else? But they'll also, uh, there, there's an Eastern Orthodox sin called prelist, P-R-E-L-E-S-T. Prelist is the sin of thinking that you are more spiritually advanced than you are and you have a greater understanding of higher things than you actually do. I, of course, would never uh, be tricked into prelist because I know how wonderful I am. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, uh, but no, but uh, one of the things Climacus talks about, in addition to like literally, like, oh, yeah, now there's this young brother who kept coming to me with black eyes, telling me his superior was hitting him, and then one day he died, but then the superior repented and lived in a cell in the graveyard, praying night and day for the rest of his life. <laughs> this is an interesting question right here by Ted Francis. Do you think Philotherapeutae could be a pre-Christian hesychasm movement? Um, you know, I, I will admit, I don't know a lot about, I only know a little bit about it, but the Hesychasts were careful to differ, even though they use a lot of the same terms, they were careful to differentiate themselves from earlier Hesychast, uh, from earlier meditative movements, like Stoicism, like, they, and, and they use a lot of the same technical language as Stoicism, right. while also while using it talking about how it, 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 this is often when they're talking about using hesychasm the practice of prayer and silencing and meditation to achieve a state called sometimes like apatheia which sounds like the english word apathetic but it's not exactly the same thing you're it, it's and that's a term that's also used in stoicism so it's like so it's about conquering your passions and it's about conquering yourself, but it is not exactly the same thing. So I think uh, that things like the therapeutii are important precursors to hesychasm, and, but I also think that hesychasm, at least from the perspective of the Hesychasts of the more ancient tradition, uh, like it is so heavily focused on the life of Jesus that I, while I think you can say that there are strong pieces of tradition connecting the two, I suspect that the Hesychasts would say, well, if it doesn't have Jesus, it's not Hesychasm. Wow. And it's like, it's, it sort of reminds me of like, 
Christians trying to distance themselves from from just regular Platonism, where as in you can't really do it. It's like Christian Christian. You could see the middle Platonist uh, seeping into the text, seeping into the theology, and I think this is another example of that where you have this this meditative practice that sort of with just by default has the traits of the meditative groups that come before it. That's just how everything is. That's just evolution of ideas in general. You know? Absolutely. Um, so I, I, you know, and I, but I also think, you know, a lot among a lot of the early fathers, I mean, uh, you know, the last time I was on, we were talking about Hippolytus and we can look at folks like origin who are gotten rid of later. There's a lot of pressure to be right in the early church. And so, and, and also like that pressure comes later, which texts are saved, et cetera. So I, 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 I think you're right, but I, I also suspect that there is more openness that we're not seeing in some ways. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of what I had a question that I was trying to think about. Oh, oh, um, Gregory P- Palamas. So what, what what exactly happened with him? It, how does he end up? Does he stay at Paphos for his whole life? Does he end up leaving and doing something else? What, what's his outcome? What does he do? Well, I mean, importantly, he, um, he his there, so there's a series of ecumenical councils after the fight between Barlam and Gregory Palamas. The ecumenical, there, there are like literally six of them, I think, through like the 1350s is what I get for not having all my notes in front of me. Okay. And and much like the early ecumenical councils, you know, where we, you know, we, we get things like the Nicene Creed. They basically say Gregory Palamas' side is 100% accurate and Barlam was forced to recant and like he destroyed his own writings. Wow. Here's yeah. a question that just popped up. Thank you for the super chat. Thoughts on calligraphy? Um, well, I think calligraphy is really beautiful. Uh, I, and also, my buddy, Brother Sean, it, like, is a, at times, professional calligraphist. He's also uh, a composer. I mean, he's, he's one of those people who's uh, very smart. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the... It, 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 it is one of those things where you have to be extremely careful. I have I have tried calligraphy, but I mine always looks like a uh, a hog's lunch or something. Yeah, well, I'm I'm trying to think of where, where I've seen some like I think it was I don't think it was Greek I think it was like um what's that that old old church Slavonic uh, type of I think I've seen calligraphy in that text before. I'm not sure where it's from or what time period, but that looked pretty, pretty interesting. It reminds, it sort of reminded me of the Arabic Muslim calligraphy that we see today. Like it's really prominent today, which is beautiful, by the way. Beautiful. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I've always, it's really fascinating when you have sort of intentional limitations on art, like you're not going to have figurative art. So you have all of this really extreme non-figurative uh, beautiful geometric patterns, beautiful calligraphy, uh, and you know what? And, and really, I guess this all does come back to has a chasm around like the question of symbols and ultimate realities. Like, how do you connect the symbol to the ultimate reality? And yeah. you know, with calligraphy and stuff, you know, you're like you're, this. This right here, you see that the, that that first line in red. Yeah, that's clearly clearly calligraphy i think i could be wrong but it looks like it's looks like it's designed to look very artistic you know what i mean is that church slavonic yep that's the slavonic this is what i was thinking of i've seen a lot of that i've seen a lot of examples i have a book called um journey through medieval manuscripts uh-huh. where do i have it somewhere over here it is amazing um i can't remember who i don't even know who i, I had the book but anyways it's got pages of reprinted manuscripts from the medieval times and it's got tons of this kind of stuff it's really 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 great book um yeah that's a clear that calligraphy yeah yeah and and speaking of church slavonic you know hesychasm has a very rich history in the 
you know, once or, you know, because after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, you have like the last surviving Byzantine princess runs to the Pope and the Pope's like, I don't know what to do with you. So he ends up sending her to the only, you know, the biggest Orthodox uh, leader around who's um, in Russia. And so Russia becomes, or, you know, Russia really becomes the uh, third Rome. Oh, as sure. Or as some people say it's the fourth Rome. If you want to call it a Holy Roman Empire, it's the third Rome. So yeah. you- but that's the Russians who will fight you. About. That's just Europe. That's just Europe. It's just yeah. a fake name. I do not consider them Romans at all. But, I um, mean, they're fascinating too. They, you know, they married some Byzantine princesses. Oh yeah, there's a lot of those. That's for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, the story goes that at when when Constantinople was finally taken over by Mehmed II, uh, the the church leaders, the bishops, the uh, priests and all they took a boat through the black sea into into russia they didn't go into europe they went to russia and set up in saint peter's or or, or saint petersburg i mean and that's that's the story that i've heard from from a lot of people that that's how the church in uh there already was a church in russia at that time it's not like they didn't start then but they said that's how it that's how it got to it's like became the real big church at that time but who knows this people debate that too sure That's, that's beautiful right there isn't it Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, and the history of sort of Slavic people becoming Orthodox, you know, if you look at like the Bulgarian, the foundations of the Bulgarian Empire, great stuff. But you have, uh, you have it spread. And, And there are people who I've read who say that like one of the reasons that Orthodox Christianity survived in both Russia and continued to survive under the Ottoman Empire is because hesychasm is such an incredibly powerful uh, spiritual practice. And yeah. it also is a spiritual practice, which you can do in very isolated circumstances. Yeah, you can be living under a, uh, an Islamic empire and you're still doing your thing in the mountains. No one's going to bother you. Who cares? Yeah. Why, why would they care? You know? Yeah, I mean, you... Uh, <laughs> you know. That's so good there, Yeah, I mean, and so... When I learned hesychasm, I first learned it from a gay uh, Episcopalian. Then um, I made friends with a Russian Orthodox guy who wow. continues to be one of my best friends. And Interesting. Yeah. he um, And I actually was talking. I went to the beach with him over the weekend and was talking to him about what oh, I was going to say. I forgot to Today's your birthday, isn't it? It is. Happy birthday. Everybody in the chat, give a happy birthday if you, if you, yeah. have, if you have a keyboard. Yeah. I'm but, very excited. It's the last prime number birthday before my favorite prime number, which is 41. Because if you nice. multiply 41 times three, it's one, two, three. Nice. 47. So it's my pre primo prime birthday. I'm That's pretty awesome. happy. But yeah, I was at the beach. Let me tell you the best thing you can do for a party is to go drink some beers at the beach and talk about uh, ancient Greek religion. My yeah, thing. Sounds like a good time to me. <laughs> but my, my buddy Dimitri did want me to make the point sure. uh, that don't exoticize as a chasm. It's not magic. It's something that people are practicing. Sure. Orthodox Church is alive and well. So... Let no one say that I have pretended it's not real. But I got into it. And I got into saying the hesychastic prayer. You know, I was in the army. I was like a closet case dealing with a lot of stuff when I was in Iraq. And, you know, like we got rocketed all the time. And I and I hold no anger against the people firing rockets. But let me tell you, being rocketed like a couple of times a week will shake you up. Yeah, it's not good. You know, we had three young men die. Like you, you like, yeah. You are true. aware of what it. You are aware of what is happening, but if you are down in the dust and the gravel, and you're like, boom, boom, and you know, you know, you're on the dartboard, as it were. The hesychastic prayer. You know, you are not able to leave the situation, but you're able to sort of, you know, wow. you're able to enter into the eternal in a way sort of wow. but no, and I, I saw that super chat let me just read it so if anyone can't see i'll just read it to them sure Constellation pegasus thank you for the super chat you need to do a video on the hindu gita robert oppenheimer learned sanskrit so that he could understand it better 
Erwin Schrodinger, also very impressed by the story. These two were on the level of Albert Einstein. First of all, I've read this Gita very, very, probably like six, seven times. It's not that long. It's very short. The Gita is, an, is a small story within, um, well, okay, the Bhagavad Gita, if he's talking about, he's talking about the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is a small story within the, the Mahabharata, which is a long, basically like a Bible text. But the the Bhagavad Gita is very short, and it's it's like a, they, it's like the um, story went on the mound where you have Krishna and he's got this prince named Arjun, and Arjun is in a dilemma. He has to go to war with his uncles and his cousins over the land, over the kingdom, and he doesn't want to kill his own family. Well, Krishna tells him, "This is the way of the world. This is how this is how things have to play out. You have to do it. It's better to take action than inaction." which is kind of, I would say, the opposite of the Buddhist message where sometimes inaction is action. But I do I do like your comment, and I, I actually, actually, if you guys look at my old videos, I have a video on the, on the Bhagavad Gita. I, I, I did a whole video on it, so it's, it's already in my library. I just forgot about that for some reason. But I should talk about it more. What do you think about it? You know, it is, uh, I, I will admit, I do not know much about Hinduism. It is one of those things where I want to my father in the last year before he died bought a huge number of hindu texts and he was like one well, I, I need to get into reading these and they are most of them are sitting on a bookshelf in the other room so i have all this stuff that i theoretically should do, i you know but i i don't know i wish i i i, I would it is one of those things where it is hinduism is so deeply connected it's such an, I mean, you know, it's the old, you know, it's so old. You look at, you know, the Indus River civilizations, you know, they've affected everything. There's strong evidence for, you know, connections between Zoroastrianism and Hinduism. And Zoroastrianism, of course, had a huge influence on Christianity. So it's not even like, you know, these are totally, you know, they're separated by a couple thousand miles. Um, so I don't know, like I, 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 I don't have, unfortunately, anything really smart to say about it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting text. Um, but you know what I, you know, I to, to bring this back to how it compares to Christianity and even has, a, um, even this particular, um, line of Christianity, the Buddhists, when the Buddhists came around, they came out of Hinduism in the same way Christianity came out of Judaism. And they flipped the message on its head, just like Jesus did. The Buddha says that inaction is the true way. Sometimes it's peaceful instead of going. Like he's trying to, he is within within the, how do I say this? He, he's coming out of the tradition of the of the Vedic tradition. But he's changing things up and saying, no, this is how it's done now. Just like Jesus comes around and says, no, sometimes you have to love your enemies. Sometimes you sometimes it's okay to turn the other cheek. Sometimes it's okay to let a let an adulterer live just because don't stone her to death. And that that I, I love it's it's interesting to see these two different movements sprouting up and coming out of their traditions the way they do. Sure. And Zoroastrianism, uh, you know, Zoroaster is also a reformer. Yes. You know, and also Mazdaites. Like Socrates was a reformer. It's why they killed him. They accused him of that's such a good him. point, though. And that's you should be a reformer always. You should like it's not. I'm not saying that you should always attack every tradition and just be anti everything, but you should always be looking to be progressive in your in your worldview, even if you're in a tradition. You always should be looking for the right. What the truth? That's what the logos is. The logos is reasoning, divine reasoning, the truth against against dogmatism against uh f f fallacies against all the all the things that aren't true you're supposed to fight against false falsehoods that's what that's that's important and i think that's a universal concept that can be that, that that's healthy for our religious movements i think absolutely and, and i think like one of the going back to hesychasm one of the the fact that the goal of hesychasm is or at least one of the goals of hesychasm is this direct, unmitigated, un unmediated experience of 
the uncreated God, like it, and, and you can get into thinking about this because, like, have you ever had any true uncreated experience of like any other person? Or have you only experienced the light and the sound and the physical sensation created by them? What do you mean? Say that again. I'm sorry. I didn't understand that. So th th this idea of seeking this direct experience of God, this unmitigated, un unmediated experience of God, like you kind of don't have unmediated experiences. Like you're not seeing a person, you're seeing oh, like hands yeah. off that person. You're, yeah, not yeah, yeah. you're not like hearing the person. You are, you know, you're experiencing like these waves in the air. You know, you touch somebody. I mean, you're, you know, is it like electricity and shit in your nerves? Yeah. And so this idea of there is some piece of you that is beyond physical reality. And sorry, my dog is aware it's raining outside. Oh, <laughs> he's going to get that rain. But, uh, you know, you can have an unmediated experience only if you have been divinized, that you have been raised up in some way, that they're your eyes, but then they're also like, your true eyes. I mean, and the language around this stuff is crazy. Like, right. Because you can literally be said to become a God in this. And, yeah. Like, which, was like early, which was a Christian, early Christian practice among the Carpocratians. They deified, uh, what's his name? I can't remember the guy's name. Oh, um, Epiphanius, Epiphanes, whatever his name is. He got deified. He was a Christian. There was a full blown Christian apotheosis. And we have tons of evidence for it. This was an idea that was going going happening in early Christian circles. There's also sure. the idea of gnosis, attaining gnosis, which I talk about all the time. Absolutely. And I think that there's a slight difference between apotheosis and theosis. Yeah. Like apotheosis is a little more like you have like the apotheosis of Hercules when he goes from being a demigod on earth to, you know, yeah. wife gives him a poison shirt because she thinks he actually, wait, no. He was in a rage caused by one or other of the gods and he killed her. He killed their children. And so she gives him a, po a cloak poisoned with a, uh, with Hydra venom. And I didn't do any of this research. This is just off the shelf in there. And he dies and he eventually, you know, he gains apotheosis and now he's up on Olympus married to the twin goddesses of youth and beauty. Interesting. You know, I assume playing the electric guitar, but that's different than what you have in Christianity. Uh, Translation podcast has just said, just adding to what he just said. One day you should go through your books so we can get ideas on what books to buy for our interest in future research. I would love to do that. It, it would be a long video, though. I have a lot. Almost everything I own is some, some either a translation of a of some ancient or you know like Tacitus or. Plato, or it's all it's all basically my whole library is it's just like primary sources translated some of them i have the the, the greek on one side and english on the other i like i try to find those if i could that way i can actually do some practicing and looking at the text but they don't always have those sometimes you just have to go with oxford translations or penguin or whatever but i do have a i have a decent library for for what i do you know how about you? Do you, what do you? What do you? How's your? What's your life? Because you are well read on these on these subjects. You are very, very knowledgeable about this stuff. So do you? Do, what do you? Do you use the internet? Do you use uh, audio books? What do you do? Well, I uh, I love getting PDFs of things. I love I love a good book scanner. I what? used the book scanner at the Duke University Library until the motor burned out. Mm -hmm. um, I. I have a thing where sometimes I get headaches if I read too much. So I do a lot of text to speech. I, and let me just say it is incredible how much better like the Google books text to speech functionality than like the Kindle is. It's getting like, good. It's getting real good. If I'm sorry, if you can't allow people to turn the pages with text to speech because you're afraid of them like stealing the book or something, like look, just let me just let me text to speech my stupid books on mysticism. Right. 
No, I, I mean, I love, I love running while I listen to books. I love putting on a book on the speaker and going swimming in the lake and just sitting and listening. I tend to throw on an audio book at night when I'm going to sleep or something. I love to read. I love like Plutarch, um, Ge- Geomblichus. I like the, these ancient Middle Platonist writers, Pl- Philo. I just like to listen to their their ideas. I just want to know what they're. I like to get the context of the time period that I'm trying to be critical of and study it and study at because I want to know the culture. What what was happening? You get a, like a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people just look at like if they're studying the Bible, they just look at the text. And they're seeing it through their own modern worldview, but when you when you read everything, even even someone like um, what's his name? Uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, Demosthenes. Someone like Demosthenes, who is an Athenian politician. He doesn't. He's not saying anything about theology or philosophy. It's all just like law stuff. Oh, you know. But even reading someone like Demosthenes gives you an idea of the time period. It gives you some sort of window of what what were, what was like the topics of the day what, what were people debating what was the politics of the day demosthenes is a great read for that so i like to i like to switch it up and try getting different topics different uh people from different time periods i think my main my main window is i start i'm mostly centered in like 350 bc to 350 ad that whole like 600 700 year time period is where i'm mostly looking at alexander the great to constantine that's like my what's like my world so that this world that you're like this time period where with um with uh what's his name um like you know uh Palamis, it's a little bit later so i, I but I do, that's what i need to start doing i need to start looking at how christianity unfolds throughout the centuries because it's, it's fascinating and there's a lot of different avenues like you mentioned it goes in different directions different branches out you have these most people don't even know about these people people living in in the mountains meditating people don't even know that you know i mean like if you were interested in middle play in like neoplatonism genuinely you got to read pseudo dionysus you got to read the celestial hierarchy you got to read the ecclesiastical hierarchy you got to read like he wrote a bunch of letters to, because it's not actually Dionysius. It's someone writing hundreds of years later, pretending to be not Dionysius. So he also like writes like, it's like, here's my letter to Polycarp. Here's my letter to Hippolytus. Here's my letter to Origen. And, you know, he's sort of like commenting on them, but it's really, it's great stuff. You'll enjoy it. But um, David, David Hillman goes, Iamaclis, smart, but smells like sulfur all the time. <laughs> you gotta watch out although literally john climacus talks about how you need to get used to like in the monastery like smelling other people and dealing with them and not complaining like genuinely john climacus sounds like it, it just sounds like he's had the least pleasant life of anyone in the christian tradition like yeah. He's, you know, um, that's, that's how it is, though. It's, you know, so he talks about receiving dreams. And he says, if you do hesychasm, then you're going to if you practice hesychasm. You're going to have. <laughs> Although the stylites are also a part of this same tradition. So this is all connected uh, for yeah. any viewers who don't know who the, uh, the stylite monks are. These are people who literally sit on top of a pillar and pray oh yeah i've heard about these people yeah yeah and it's like you have a bucket and the who's the, who is the guy that was doing that in like the time of constantine somebody somebody was doing that um <laughs> there are a bunch and some of them got pretty famous because yeah it's a real i guess i guess this, there's somebody in constantinople who was doing it for like a year or some some crazy amount of time i can't remember oh. what it was People did it for like 30 years at a time where they would just. Like, it's, it's so hard to believe that someone would live on top of a pillar for 30. Like what would happen to your body if you're not moving around? You're sitting in one spot. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like, and genuinely. John Climacus talks a lot about physical mortification. And like, this is why it's like one of those texts where you like really have to be careful. Like, just let me tell you, 
to any of your fans and viewers, nobody starved themselves to death for God. If, 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 uh, if any spirits are telling you or any ideas from inside yourself or saying that God wants you to like literally starve yourself to death, that's the devil. <laughs> Just don't listen to that one. And even Climacus says, don't actually starve yourself to death. Starving, you know, but fast. Yeah. Though. yeah. There's that idea of fasting. Constellation Pegasus with a super chat says, seems like people, seems people like us, here who left religion from education have big libraries on this stuff traumatic events lead to big libraries and re real researching activities guess i'm in good company here yeah that's 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 definitely that's definitely true i yeah. mean i am i will admit i have been obsessively following what is going on in the southern baptist convention my entire life even though i have not been a southern baptist in 20 years i am Oh, they're in so much trouble. Oh. Yeah, what's going on with them? Uh, a big report came out in the last couple of months that showed that they uh, have a bigger child sexual abuse problem than even the Roman Catholic Church. Like, uh, it, like stuff yeah, like the president of this signs with "God hates fags." Blah blah blah. They have them at the church too. And you, won't, if you, if someone who lives down there drives by with their with their phone, you'll <laughs> see. <laughs> The God Hates Fags people are Westboro Baptist, which is an independent Baptist church. Oh, so this isn't the same people? No, no. This is the oh. Southern Baptist Convention, which is... Oh, okay. I'm getting it mixed up. And, and like, the Southern Baptist Convention itself is a... You know, I could give... <laughs> I mean, what we're, we're getting into the second hour, uh, but... Right, yeah, yeah. Essentially, they're not like the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church is all one big institution... While in theory, the Baptists are a bunch of tiny little institutions that occasionally work together for the purpose of like missions work or like theological education. But in fact, they're also a big institution. But because they're both are and aren't one big institution, they've had a lot of problems with abusers in the church just moving to a different place and wow. continuing to do. So, anyway, uh, watch out out there. But I, but I think. You know, I, I think that when you grow up in a religion that, you know, like, you know, I, it's not just the anti-gay stuff. You know, I saw when I was a teen in the Southern Baptist world being sent to all these like youth retreats and stuff where they would like keep you all night up all night, like standing up and like swaying back and forth to praise music. And looking back, I'm like, well, that's just how they're just trying to like manufacture a spiritual experience or something, which, wow. you know, it, it's not like, but I think, you know, it is like, I, I, I've definitely known people who've like left the Southern Baptists and, uh, their experiences like well you know i'm done with religion forever Your but, son was, was at the southern baptist church let me tell you before i become conscious i was into hardcore reform theology big on puritanism it's crazy how indoctrinating it was it's wild and also let me say i remember when this because i left the southern baptists when i was a teenager in like 2003 but i remember before that when the southern baptists were proudly not reformed and how you would have southern baptists like talk about how reformed theology didn't make any sense how could we have predetermination it's all about free will uh soul freedom that kind of thing so even in my lifetime i have seen southern baptist theology change significantly and it's really weird i'll just say it and uh, I, th I think conservatism Whenever, not conservatism in all cases, because like, I mean, hey, I practice a role, you know, a spiritual practice that's thousands of years old. I'm conserving a lot. But I think that when you are saying, you know, like in John Climacus, when you say, well, if you have a religious superior, then even if you're being abused, you literally do not have the authority to judge the person who is abusing you. So you just have to take it. And I think that that idea, unfortunately, comes up in a lot of places. And I, I will just say, I 
cling to that kind of hierarchy is incredibly damaging and painful. And uh, if anyone ever tries to tell you that it's okay for them to abuse you because they have religious rank on you, fuck them. I mean, that's just, you know, Jesus. And and I think that even goes back to Jesus. Like Jesus was pretty clear that if you hurt people, right. Even if you're a Christian who's like doing miracles in Jesus's name, it don't count. So don't hurt nobody. Um, Yeah. But yeah. So I don't know. Like I, I am fascinated by this stuff. I think hesychasm, you know, when I was teaching hesychasm, I once had a class and I was like, all right, we're going to sit down and we're all just going to meditate uh, for the next five minutes, you know, using the Jesus prayer. And then we're all going to talk about our experience of it together. And this guy at the end of it goes, like he is panting like he had gone running. You know, it's like, oh, how, how can you stand this? And I think that that's kind of true. Like you have to build up your ability to meditate like a muscle. And I do think that if you're like, and like I've had friends who are Buddhist tell me about this because I've sort of talked with some Buddhist folks about their experience of meditation, but I don't want to present myself as an expert. But one thing that both John Climacus and my buddy, who's a Buddhist chaplain at a hospital around here both said is that if you're really getting into meditation, you start having all sorts of weird things. When you really start getting quiet, you have all the old stuff bubble up. You have your old angers, your old disappointments, your old embarrassments, but also like your weird sexual stuff. Like you'll just, you know, feel all your lust and horniness. And, you know, you'll have like meditating can be a really intense experience because you are forced to like sit with yourself. It's like, like when you're meditating with hesychasm, if as you're moving towards peace, it's sometimes like someone's left the radio on and you can kind of hear the radio, but you're not exactly listening to it. But the radio is it's background noise. Yeah, but but like it's like your but like the the radio signal is your experience of yourself in the world. Wow, interesting. Yeah, and it's you know, and, and you do have to be careful because like it is easy if you are doing this to become convinced that you are having really extreme uh, experiences, and you need to like not get ahead. You know, like admittedly sometimes hesychasm causes people to think that they're the second coming of jesus so oh just- wow that's crazy anyway <laughs> constellation pegasus says last one with jesus doing all these miracles all over the place why did it take the roman authorities so, so long to see what was going on well i mean i you know it <laughs> and i know when you start off with that many hedging words obviously it's going to be a strong answer but there were a lot of miracle workers in the first century. Yep. Jewish miracle workers, pagan miracle workers from the various sects. Like miracle working was not itself a crime. What's a crime is like maybe interfering with tax collection and the markets at the temple. And also maybe saying that you are the true king of Judea, because if you're saying that you're the king and not the Roman procure or whatever, then you are in some ways a rebel. And in a time of rebels, like you see guys like Barabbas, uh, you know, you can, you can go around the countryside healing the sick for a couple of years and you know, no one, no one's gonna be that upset if you're just hanging out with lenders. Yeah, there's your dime a dozen. There's a whole bunch of them. Yeah, but you knock over the money lenders' tables. You get in the way no. of the collection yeah. of wealth. That's how you get nailed to something. Yeah, or if you go down to Jerusalem during Passover when the whole the whole nation's there gathering, and you start making a scene, that might now you might get noticed. Sure, I mean, because like, hey, this uh, is a good, this is a good point right here. Hezekiah's yeah. prayer still style is good not only for Eastern Orthodox stuff, but also for possibly hermit hermeticism and non-Kamati texts. 
I mean, absolutely. Like, yeah, you know, I love the Nagamadi texts. And literally, and like you were asking earlier about atheism too. And like people, like, I think that, you know, I, I have known Buddhists who I've talked to. Like part of seeking this void and coming to understand the non-reality of all things in some ways, or, and maybe non-reality is not exactly the right word from the Orthodox perspective. That works more from the Gnostic perspective, but they're very similar ideas. One is, you know, because the idea in the Orthodox person, you know, whatever we are is like mixed with non-being. And so mortality and imperfection is mixed with non-being through atoms bringing death in the world through original sin. So like our state of existence is inherently fallen. And then Christ fixes that by being the final Adam, who as Adam first set up, the form of humanity uh, in a bad way. Jesus fixes the form of humanity is kind of the Orthodox idea, which yeah. is very close to the Gnostic idea, except, you know, in Gnosticism, the world is much less real than, and the body is much less real. Whereas in the Orthodox conception, the body very much is real. Like this is happening, but when you get down to this idea that there is a transcendent, unknowable God that is beyond us and beyond our ability to imagine whatsoever. But, and then there are a bunch of intermediary beings and powers and authority. And then there's here us here on earth that are experiencing reality as the product of all of these powers and authorities somehow. You know, whether you want to say, like, these are, like, you know, the physical walls of the universe and, you know, time or whatever. Or, you know, it's literally, well, this is Zeus and this is Athena and they're all angels. And these various angels represent the various parts of reality. Yeah. But, Jesus asks, is there any ancient books on the scammer miracle workers? Oh, sure. Scammer miracle workers show up in the New Testament. Yeah. I think the Talmud has a lot of stuff on there too about these various miracle workers that were popping up. Yeah, um, I mean, this is often how like Simon Magus is portrayed. Yeah. Um, but you also, you know, you have stuff in like uh the Didache, which is a first century Christian handbook that is specifically talking about how apostles shouldn't be allowed to stay anywhere for more than three days because if they're just hanging out not working and collecting money they're probably scamming you <laughs> i did not know that yeah it's weird that the didache is 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 very suspicious of people calling themselves apostles you know what that reminds me of it reminds me of in the old testament where you have elisha who's you know he's going around healing sick doing all this crazy and he's got one of his followers who is Going up to houses that, for example, in the text it says that he healed somebody, didn't ask for a payment and left. The next day, the the follower went back to that house and was like, "Oh, Elisha's here for his payment. I'm the one going to collect it for you," and he just keeps it. And it's like you probably you probably was a lot of stuff like that happening with people, you know, whatever, you know, you know, what I'm saying that's I'm probably sorry. why that's in the text. Yeah, I mean, and like. You know, it, uh, the the wolves in sheep's clothing stuff. Although there's also stuff in the tech, in the gospel specifically about like the apostles meet a Christian who like isn't exactly doing their thing and they want to beat him up or stop him from preaching. And Jesus is like, no, no, just if, if they're not against us, they're with us. Yeah. Uh, so there have always been a bunch of traditions, even in the time of Jesus himself, according to the text. Right, yeah. So, got, Hana, Hanani Bendosa was quoted by the Talmud as being someone who's like really performing miracles left and right. And they even have him saying that he was a voice in the desert crying out, like quoting Isaiah, just like John the Baptist does, which is kind of interesting. There's like a parallel there. But um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And like uh, with J mentioning John the Baptist, John Climacus very much sees himself as a successor to John the Baptist as well. So in some ways by 
enacting this asceticism and this lot and this quieting prayer it, you you can also sort of be the forebearer of this experience of god in the same way that john the baptist was the for or the forerunner of christ lucian had a work called on alexander the false prophet dude had a cult around his false serpent god glaucon that lasted a century after his death <laughs> that's cool yeah. i only know glaucon uh because um alan moore talks about glaucon a bunch it's a snake with a big head of hair and you know what glaucon means no what does it mean it means sweetie oh wow yeah it's calling a god sweetie interesting yeah um anything else you want to touch on before we close this thing out and I mean, I just want to say, if you're interested, give the Jesus prayer a shot. You know, you can. Uh, I meant to have some Legos with me, but to like show a little thing you can make and put in your hand and like turn. But I think if you'll indulge me, I would love to just show people how to do it very quickly. You know, I'm not trying to proselytize. Please follow your faith, whatever you want. But if you're interested in this, just sit still, pull out your phone, go to the timer, put in, I like, I like a nice seven minute meditation to like often before I, I I'm a writer professionally. So often before I ride, I do a seven minute meditation or before I, or after I run or before I go to bed or when I'm in the bath, you know, you can also, if you want, just imagine you can have a little image in your head of like, you know, votive candles like you see in a church. Just imagine 12 votive candles, four rows of three. Just shut your eyes and imagine with each repetition of the Jesus prayer, you're lighting one of those candles. Just say, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. 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 And then when you've gone through all 12, I like to say in Our Father, you can say whatever you want. I sometimes say the Magnificat, but the Magnificat is long enough. That's Mary's prayer, you know, about bringing down the rich from their thrones. Do you think these? Do you think these Gregorian chants were designed for meditate, meditative practices? Chant is incredibly meditative. You ever, you ever throw one of those on when you're doing it? So I don't. You, I don't like to listen to chant outside of the context of the liturgy i love like the daily office you get like you read the basically the entire bible over two years and you get i like to do evening prayers and i usually say the jesus prayer is a part of that but i love going to church like i love when chant is actually a part of the liturgical cycle of life um and you know we do some compline at my parish sometimes compline is an evening prayer service at uh, St. Luke's Cathedral in Seattle. Uh, really, in like the early 2000s, in the Episcopal tradition, got sung Compline, but like Gregorian chant, going again. And, uh, you know, uh, among others, I helped uh, push it to parishes. And it, like having an evening 30 minutes where you have the readings for the day, you have these beautiful hymns, the entire thing is chanted like it, you know, it's why I'm an Episcopalian. It got me. Um, oh, interesting. And I think, you know, and even if you're fascinated in Gnosticism, frankly, it's a lot of the same technical language. And I think like having, if you want to actually try to explore seeking the unknowable God that is either the void or beyond the void or both the void and not the void and transcending the void. You know, if you want to, there is like a path up the mountain. There's a, there's a trail that if you are interested, 
you can just say the Jesus prayer to yourself 12 times in a row over and over while you take a shower. And if you do it every day a little bit it, and there's a good chance it'll grow, it'll be a part of your life. And I'm not saying you'll like be wrestling with big horny demons. And I'm not saying, you know, you're going to ascend to the mountaintop <laughs> and the great light will break forth. But you know, meditation is awesome. It's exciting. You get to, it's incredible. Like, it's literally the most useful spiritual practice. It'll uh, make you better able to deal, or it has made me better able to deal with every single part of my life. So well, that's interesting. And I'm glad you come back on and uh, we'll do this again soon. We'll do this again. We'll find another topic and do this again soon. And um, yeah, thank you for coming. And by the way, happy birthday too. Woo! Yeah, no, I survived another year. They ain't stopped me yet. <laughs> and like well, I always say, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The demiurge has no power over.